In 2005, life as I knew it changed forever with a simple phone call. I called a friend of mine, Dan, who had just returned from five weeks in Niger, West Africa. He was there as official photographer for the Canadian team. He was distraught on the phone and could barely function. I asked him what was wrong, and he said he could not get the images of the children of Niger out of his mind. He told me that he went to visit a school, and his colleagues and Canadian athletes saw that 30 children were sharing one pencil. My heart broke, and I instinctively said, Dan, stop talking. Let's just do something. He said, what are we going to do? I said, I have no idea. I'll call you back. And I picked up a phone that day, and I called the Canadian consulate in Niger. Of course, they spoke to me in French, and my French was terrible. But I asked if we could send some supplies. And they said, no, we're a consulate, but we'll recommend someone. And they gave me the name of a man. I called him up right away. His name was Amadou. He didn't speak a word of English and told me to call at 7 that night, which I did. His son answered the phone. And I said, who is your dad, and what does he need? And it turns out his father was the mayor of a commune called Libore with 25,000 people. And I asked him, please send me your wish list. And a few days later on the email came a list of everything you can imagine, pens, paper, rulers, notebooks. And then I got scared. What am I doing? Who am I to think I can help? And who are these people? But I took myself over to my local office supply store, and I asked for the manager, and a man came out named Michael. I said, Michael, you don't know me, but there's 30 kids sharing a pencil far away. Can you help? And he looked at me, and he said, Robin, I decided this year it wasn't going to be about me. I want to join your team. What team? <laughs> and it was extraordinary, but he walked me up and down the aisles and started putting in one of everything into the cart because we decided what we would do is send one of everything and see if the box got there safely and see if it's what they needed. And I immediately figured out, you know, I was worried about how to send it there, but I called the president of DHL, and they, he was remarkable and said he would send it. The mayor received the package and immediately called the Canadian consulate to witness the opening of the box. And that spoke volumes to me. And over the course of the next while, we sent another four boxes with 100 school bags over. Thank you, DHL. And the mayor called all the villagers together and the top achieving students. And in a ceremony filmed on national television, handed out a school bag to every student who came forward. And then we collected 24 more boxes in my basement and we hauled it over. We had volunteers, we had wonderful people, but we didn't know what we were doing. And we knew it wasn't sustainable. So I said, I have to go there. I went over there. My daughter was a journalist working in Ghana. I picked her up. And on one of the flights on the way to Niger, I met a man named Peter. And Peter looked at me on the plane. He was from England. He said, Robin, why are you going to Niger? Nobody goes to Niger. And I told him the story of how Pencils for Kids was born. And at the end of the flight, Peter gave me $100. And I said, oh, Peter, please don't give me your money. You don't even know me. A and we haven't collected any money yet. We don't know what we're doing. And he said, Robin, I trust you. More pressure. And we arrive at the airport, and the mayor and his entourage greets us. With all of his colleagues, we could barely understand each other. And he shows me Labore with 15 villages, no electricity, no running water, no supplies in any of the schools, no notebooks, no chalk for the boards. And the next day, in front of one of the villages and national television again, my job is to hand out one notebook to every student who comes up. And they bow in front of me. And I've never looked at a notebook the same again, because here in our country and in your school, we have hundreds for every subject and student as they go through school. There it was very precious. The following day, I took him to the Canadian consulate, thinking there was some local money. And before I knew what would possibly happen with that, that he could apply for from CETA, he takes me the following day to a village remote in the middle of the desert, and the chief and the women and the children and the villagers are all in front of me. And the mayor is explaining in Zarma, their local language, that I have come to build a school. <laughs> That's how I felt. And then he stood up and walks me a few paces in the desert, and in French he says, Madame Mednick, would you like the school over there? And then he takes a few paces in the desert this way, and he says, or Madame Medic, would you like the school over there? And my daughter was filming, and I remember thinking, Monsieur Le Maire, please let there be money. We, you can put the school wherever you want. 
And the following day at the airport, on the way home, I took that $100 from Peter who had given it to me on the plane. I said, here is a money from this man. And he looked at me, the mayor, and he said, we will engrave that man's name on the first desk in the first school that we build together. I got home. I right away called Peter in England. I said, you're not going to believe this. He said, Robin, you're not going to believe this. A friend of mine, Marcelo, is about to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. And I told him to raise money for pencils for kids. I said, Peter, if he's going to climb tell him to take a little sign saying pencils for kids and hold it at the summit and take a picture of himself. And one day, we'll frame it and put it in the new school that we build together. And we'll show the kids that they too can climb any mountain if they have the willingness to try. And sure enough, within a few weeks, the mayor applied for funding from CEDA locally and received it for the building of the first pencils for kids school in that same village he'd taken me to. Peter Marcello and their colleagues raised thousands of dollars and wired it over. And in November 2007, my husband and I went back for the opening of that first school, and we saw Peter's name engraved on the desk and Marcello's picture up on the wall. In the intervening five and a half years, Pencils for Kids has learned a bit about sustainability. We've built two more schools. Communities First Library, Scholarships for Girls, Sewing Center for Girls, sponsored nine kindergartens, invited Rotary to come and drill wells, and Orbis to come and train eye doctors, and they actually operated on 95 people in our community. We even started a wear a pencil campaign. This is made of rock by a local artist in Niger, and it's a campaign that we say wear a pencil until every child in the world has a pencil, because we see it as a symbol of education, literacy, and hope. So why am I here today? because your theme is life as we don't know it. And the big lesson I've learned is to embrace what you don't know. You will learn things in school, you will learn things in business, but you will still face challenges in your life for which you are ill-prepared. So what do you do? Do you take a few steps back or do you go forward? I think you do what the famous writer Ray Bradbury said. You walk to the edge of the cliff, you jump off, and you build your wings on the way down. And how do you embrace what you don't know? There's three things. The first, the first thing is to take a step and do it afraid. I've been fearful for seven years. I was afraid to go in a country where I didn't speak the language, afraid to go in a country where I didn't understand the culture. I didn't know the first thing about international development. But my gut spoke before my head could think and my feet just followed my gut. So if you have fear, like I do, then just do it afraid. The second thing is to surround yourself with excellence, because if you don't know something, others will. We've got a phenomenal team, all volunteers. But one day I heard of a professor, Dov Pasternak, who was a renowned scientist in agriculture, and he was living in Niger and he had an idea, farmers of the future. Let's teach the kids in primary school how to properly farm, not to eat, but to make it a business, to sell and to thrive. And I wrote him and I said, I want to pilot your program. And today, three years later, we are piloting three gardens beside three primary schools to teach the kids how to grow and how to sell and to how to invest with full support from the Ministry of Education in Niger. And the third thing that I learned to embrace what you don't know is to abandon your expectations and instead expect the unexpected. I worried at the beginning every night, would we raise enough money? Would we have enough, would the scholarship girls succeed? Would the sewing girls, when they graduate, be able to make a living? And then I just thought, I can't do this. I can't worry all the time. We can do our best. We can surround ourselves with great people. And at the end of the day, the universe will unfold as it will. So an example of unexpected, a month ago, it rained heavily in Niger. And in Libore, our community, 10,000 people lost their homes, their rice crops, devastating. At first, I was overwhelmed. And then Dov Pasternak came up with an idea. The rice is gone. Let's plant Dalek. What the heck is Dalek? <laughs> it's apparently a plant that will thrive where the rice crops won't. And we're right now, as we speak, introducing it to the farmers and hoping that it will turn a disaster into an opportunity. I don't know. At the end of the day, what I've learned is that I don't know what will work and what will not work. But I do know that we've offered hope to a community far away, and we've let them know they're not alone. On one of my trips to Niger, a woman came up to me 
and she gave me this little torn piece of paper, and it says her name, Asa Amadou, and then an equal sign, and then the word friend. And then I realized we were not alone. So my message to you is embrace what you don't know and live the life that you don't know. Because if you do, you will understand the five important lessons that the pencil maker told the pencil before putting him back in his pencil case. He said, and I quote, everything you do will always leave a mark. You can always correct the mistakes you make. What is important is what is inside of you. In life, you will undergo painful sharpenings, which will only make you better. And to be the best pencil, you must allow yourself to be held and guided by the hand that holds you. Thank you.